Hey, welcome to the One Piece of the Time Distilling Institute with your host, the alchemist of Indiana's Black Forest, Alan Bishop. Hey, this channel is all about home distilling and legal distilling. If you've got questions, reach out to us in the comments below, social media, or via bishopshomegrown at gmail.com. And don't forget to check out thealchemistcabinet.com. Hey, gang, back again with the One Piece of the Time Distilling Institute, uh, your source for all things legal and home distilling. So, uh, as always, reach out to me, thealchemistcabinet.com. Uh, support us by buying our books. I am working on volume three of the book right now. I'm also working with Brian Cushing at the Victorian Bar Room on a book that includes Victorian era cocktails and how to make them, as well as how to make the spirits that go into those Victorian era cocktails. I think that's a pretty unique thing that I don't see out there in the market that you guys might really enjoy. So, be on the lookout for that. It's still a little ways down the line, but um, it is coming. So, today we've got a, a great question. Um, from Sean Rigsby of all people. So Flatlander sent me a question uh, and it's a, it's a good one. It's an interesting one. So I know Sean is a fan of white spirits. He's not a big fan of aged spirits or brown spirits in general. Um, and he feels like the barrel oftentimes covers up a lot of the flavor. And I think that that can be true. But so, you know, my, part of my methodology at Spirits of French Lake has always been, you know, as opposed to a big time Kentucky distiller who will tell you that 60, 70 percent of that flavor is coming from the barrel. My methodology with distillation has always been a more brandy oriented methodology. Right. And when I say brandy, I mean, not only the Hoosier style of apple brandy, but also cognac, um, Armagnac, Calvados. Right. The idea that grain has terroir in the same way that grapes have terroir, or apples have terroir. The idea that I want 50 percent of the flavor to come from raw materials that was in the field as well as fermentation and distillation, and then the other 50% of the flavor to come from maturation. And what you're ideally looking for is all the positive attributes of the raw material to still be present alongside the maturation to where you're flavor bridging between what the oak brings and what the raw material brings. And the reason for that for me is that I'm a pot still distiller and pot still distillation is all about retention and concentration of flavor. Um, and this other idea of, to me, if you're gonna advertise, for example, let's say a weeded bourbon, no matter how old that bourbon gets, you should always be able to taste the positive attributes that the wheat contributed. Otherwise, why even bother to differentiate it and call it a weeded bourbon or tell anyone what your mash bill is, right? Um, to me, when you just say bourbon uh, and you're not differentiating what the mash bills are, what the grains are, putting any emphasis at all on the grain, what you're really saying is we make industrial alcohol that tastes like the barrel. And that's all we taste. So I do agree with Sean on that completely. <coughs> um, I do think there's a, there's a way that you can have the best of both worlds, right? And I've tried my hardest to be able to do that at Spirits of French Lake and continue to do it and continue to try to find ways to make that happen, happen in interesting ways that are acceptable to the consumer and actually warranted and wanted by certain consumers. Now, bearing in mind that my crowd as a craft distiller is not the Buffalo Trace Antique Collection crowd is not the Weller crowd, is not the big bourbon crowd in general. I do have some crossover there. I've been lucky enough to get some reviews from some guys that, you know, in their time have been actual gatekeepers in the bourbon community and be able to get some attention from those guys that has, have brought some people into the fold that maybe ordinarily would not have given a craft distiller like me the time of day. But all that being said, let's get to Sean's question. So say you have what I call support shine i like that uh or as jesse calls it a safety net right so which is corn flavored sugar shine and a fully converted corn liquor put both in two barrels side by side same temperature same char same gallon size same proofs come back to the question i'll explain to you guys what support shine would basically mean so uh you know sugar shine would be one pound per gallon of sugar one pound per gallon of grain unconverted traditionally for a sugar shine right to one gallon of water uh, a support shine would be one pound of grain per gallon, one pound of sugar per gallon, uh, you know, et cetera, but you're actually converting the grain. Whereas on a sugar shine, you wouldn't be converting the grain. You're just using the grain as a flavoring ingredient. Uh, so this gives you alcohol from both the actual grain as well as from the sugar itself. So safety net, as Jesse from Stillet calls it. Um, after, say, four to six years, would your average run-of-the-mill bourbon fan be able to pick out which is which, or will the wood mask the flavor too much? And how would that affect the flavor in general? I'm not much of a barrel-aged fan, as I feel wood imparts way too much flavor to the spirit, as I prefer a clear brandy over any other grain. Awesome. And also, Sean, I should mention this, too. Before I got in the industry, and all the way up until probably 
I'd say six years ago. My preference was for white liquors if I was drinking something myself. It took me a long time to start to have an appreciation for the wood and what the wood can do in conjunction with the liquor and the actual transformation that happens there. And again, for me, finding that balance of raw material plus barrel coming together to make something uh, greater than the individual, right? So greater than a barrel flavored bourbon, greater than a white uh, brandy, right? So um, your average run of the mill bourbon fan they're probably not going to going to know and and i and here's what i mean by average run of the mill bourbon fan uh the guy who likes to drink bourbon you know a couple times a month usually mixed in coke or whatever your average consumer right they probably wouldn't notice but they're also probably not drinking bourbon neat truthfully um the guys that really like barrel flavor you could probably fool a lot of them uh, if you went with a heavy enough uh, toast and char on the barrel and long enough time period, etc. The people who are my consumers, for example, uh, and the people who are really into craft, craft distillates are the people who are really into big bourbon. They would be able to pick up on it pretty easily. They may not know what it is that's different, but they would know that there is something there that's different. And there's a number of reasons for that. The first reason is that specifically with double pot distilled uh, bourbons, the mash bills are very thick. There's a lot of grain that goes into it and we're really pushing a lot of grain flavor to the extent that I would almost guarantee a lot of the home distillers that are in the moonshine, they would not really prefer the white dog that I make it work off of the still. Because unless you grew up with this heavy, heavy, very grain forward distillate, it's something that it does not taste like like a, a white moonshine at all. It does not taste like a sugar shine. As a white spirit, I would much prefer to, to drink a well-made sugar shine than an all-grain white spirit. Unless that all-grain white spirit was rectified slightly to a higher proof, to say 170 proof where it's a little lighter and more floral, then it becomes a lot more palatable, and I do enjoy that. Uh, so first and foremost, there's that. So the flavor of the grain and those very heavy mash bills definitely pushes through the barrels, right? So if you try my Lee Sinclair, for example, you're going to taste the oats. You're going to taste the wheat. You're going to taste the corn. If you try my Hendostin Falls at five years old, that corn is going to smack you in the face. And it's a long chain amino acids from those corns, plus a little bit of the starchiness that kind of comes across as an aromatic precursor during distillation. Um, the other thing is... Even when you invert white sugar and you make it easier on the yeast to break that down into the CO2 and the ethanol, there's always an aroma to the white sugar. There's always aromatic precursors. There's always flavors that come across and the barrel can't completely eat those. There's a certain taste to them. There's a certain mouthfeel to them. And in a barrel, sometimes there can almost be a little bit of a, a chemical sort of flavor to them and chemical aroma to them, in my opinion. So I don't think that it would be something that most people who really know their bourbons would be fooled by average consumer absolutely 100 percent. and as a former moonshiner to be honest with you i made a lot of brown liquors uh that were sugar shines not even straight up support sugar shines right uh where you have some conversion in them but just straight sugar shines that i put in the barrels and aged and they that stuff was going out to guys that were doing exactly what i'm talking about taking it and putting it into a coke or whatever um, I don't think there's anything wrong with doing a safety net or a support moonshine and aging it. I certainly think that's a better conclusion than, say, aging a straight-up sugar shine. And I do think you'll get better results as far as the esterification that happens in the barrel from having a support sugar shine like that or a support uh, shine, as you say, um, than what you would if you did a straight-up sugar shine into a barrel. But I do think that you would have, put it this way, you would be able to tell a difference even if you didn't know. I guarantee you'd be able to tell a difference. I would be able to tell a difference. The vast majority of the people who buy my products would be able to tell the difference. They would say, no, something here's a little different, a little off. And it may not even be bad, but it definitely wouldn't come off to them as what they know as a bourbon, so to speak. So I hope that answers your question. I know it's not the most technical answer in the world, um, but you have to bear in mind that the people who would buy something, say, from, from me or from you even, um, they're pretty involved in what they're drinking, right? And so they're paying attention to what they're drinking and the details matter to them. And when the details matter and they're able to analyze things, then they want to know the answers to those questions. So yeah, I do think that people would be able to tell the difference. Again, 
you know, your folks that just want to mix it with Coca-Cola, they probably don't care, right? It's got a good flavor, a good aroma, stands up to the soda, happy. That's all they take. So that was a great question. I appreciate it. As always, guys, reach out to me, bishopshomegrown at gmail.com, YouTube comments below, and or any of my social media. And uh, check out thealchemistcabinet.com. Love y'all. Later.